John chapter 13, the gospel of John in chapter 13, God is good. John chapter 13, I'm going to read quite a few verses from John chapter 13, so just hang with me please. Verse 1, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Verse 2, and supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him, given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but you shall know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus said, If I wash thee not, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, you are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, know ye what I have done to you. You call me master and Lord and you say well, for so I am. If I then be your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. I want us to reach back to verse 3, please. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he was come from God, comma, and went to God, riseth from supper. I'm going to preach a message very quickly this morning entitled, Where Are You From? And where are you going? Look at a few folks around you and ask that question. Where are you from? And where are you going? If I was going to subtitle this message, I would call it the case for the comma. The case for the comma. Lord, we love you today. And we're very grateful for the opportunity to gather ourselves together in your beautiful sanctuary. It is on purpose we are here. For we understand that you control, you are sovereign, and you have the words of eternal life. Your narration is important to our destiny. So we say to you again, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. We bind every generational spirit and break every generational curse. And we say, have your way. Do what you want to do in this sanctuary on this morning in Jesus' name. Everyone shout praise the Lord. Let's clap our hands, please, and give God one more big praise all over the building. Bless your name. 
name, Jesus. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name. Hallelujah. Hug four people and tell them one more time, I'm glad you're in church today. I am glad you are in church. And I want to go right into comma. Indicates a pause between parts. You may be seated. A comma is an indication of a pause between parts of a sentence. I'm not standing before you today to give you a dissertation of the English language or grammar, but I do understand the power of punctuations. And many of you are at a time in your life where you feel like you have arrived at a question mark. Others of us here may feel as though we are at the end of a sentence. And someone has placed that little thing called a period in the dialogue of our destinies. For some of us here, there are certain exclamation marks declaring our expressions of excitement and enthusiasm for where we are in life. But the comma is unique because the comma declares the distinction of two parts to one sentence. Hmm. In essence, it gives you an opportunity to pause and recollect your thoughts. John certainly is not writing this narrative as it is transpiring before his eyes. This documentary happened after it was over. So it's as if he had to look back and remember the scene. Are y'all with me today? He had to get the imagery correct in his mind of what had already transpired and then scripted out. And when he looks at this particular instance, he sees some very peculiar things happening. And I find it interesting that he sets it up by telling us what time it is. He says in verse 1, it's just before the feast of the Passover. You got to understand that the feast of the Passover was something that Jesus had to face every year, we know since he was 12 years old. So now he has been going for at least a minimum of 21 straight years. The feast of the Passover was like a festival of celebration because it represented a day when the angel of death passed over the homes of the Jews. And only because of one reason, because they had the blood of a lamb on their doorpost. Amen. And he said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. So the institution was so significant that there was a festival held once per year to celebrate that passing over. Jesus is facing this entertainment. He's looking at this amusement. He's considering certainly the celebration of the death angel passing over. And I'm certain that he looked forward to this year after year, but this time is different. 
Today is a different day. There's no celebratory language coming from his mouth. As a matter of fact, when you consider the time he's facing, it is really set up for you in the previous chapter, chapter 12 and verse 23, when the Bible says that Jesus, before he got to Jerusalem for the Passover, realized or knew or discerned clearly or began to see that his hour had come. So now he's got to walk into the festival facing an hour that he knew one day was going to arrive. It was inevitable. It had to come to pass. His attitude was right. His heart was right. This hour was not always before him. This same writer is going to tell you in John chapter 2 of another festival called the wedding at the Can- in Cana of Galilee where he performed his first miracle. And Mary told the servants, do whatever he says to do. And she went to him to ask him to do certain things. And he said these words, my hour has not yet come. So it was an hour that he knew would eventually come but it was not there in chapter two, but in chapter 12, it is there. Isn't it something that we all have to face the hour? Sooner or later, you're gonna have to come to the crucible of your cause. And you're gonna have to experience things that you really don't look forward to experiencing. I'm gonna go ahead and preach today, amen. Amen, amen. I'm going to prophesy and decree and declare, cast out stuff and call in stuff. Amen. Touch somebody and tell them we're not playing around today. Amen. So he is there celebrating this certain festival. He is facing this certain hour and he's about to experience things that he has never experienced before. You'll see that when the Bible says in verse number two that chapter 13, supper being ended, the devil now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Verse 11 says, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore, he said, you're not all clean. So now we see that he's facing something he had never experienced before this time. He's facing the rejection of a close friend. Betrayal. He's about to be given up by someone who kissed him with the kiss of love. He's, he's going to be betrayed by someone that he loved with all his heart, but he knew he couldn't change what this man was gonna do. So John is thinking back and he's pinning all these things, but I liked what he says in verse one. He said, while all this is going on, uh, he pinned these three words, he loved them. (laughs) I like that now, I don't know if y'all do or not, but I, I just think it's pretty unique that in all of this, Uh, John had to say, one thing I notice about the Savior is in the midst of the festivity, in the midst of the crucible of time, uh, the pressure of the process, in the midst of the betrayal of a close friend, uh, the first thing I got to say in verse 1 before I say anything else is he loves them. And He's going to go on and say he not only loved them, but he's going to say it again. He loved them to the end, which means he already had his love established in the end result before he ever started loving them when he met them. So it did not matter what they did to him. He had chosen to love them. Why would he love them like that? John chapter 10 will tell you in verse 27 through 29 because the father gave them to him. 
And the Bible's going to tell you in those verses that he loved them so much that he held them in his hand because that's where the father put them. And then Jesus is going to say, if he put them in my hand, no man can pluck them out of my hand. I might just pause right there and just throw in a few ideas to tell you it does not matter what anybody else says to you about how God loves you. I came by to tell you the word says that he loves you with an unconditional love. My Bible tells me in Romans chapter 8 that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Neither height nor depth nor things present nor things to come, neither principalities, powers, nothing can separate you from his love. So if you don't get nothing else out of this message, leave here today knowing that God loves you to the end. So that means he already knows you're going to mess up, you're going to betray, you're going to forsake, you're going to do crazy stuff and he's going to love you all the way through all of your events and experiences. What you do is not going to change his love. He loves you to the, yeah, amen. He loves you to the ultimate. He loves you when you're stupid. He loves you when you're crazy. He loves you when you're up. He loves you when you're down. He loves you when you're twisted. He loves you when you're bent and sideways. He still, he loved you last night and he's going to love you tomorrow. I need you to tell four people he loves me like that, honey. He loves me like that. Amen. Yeah, if he didn't love me, he wouldn't choose me. Hey, I'm going to go ahead and say that. I know he loves me because he chose me. Amen. I, listen, he, nobody else chose you. He chose you. Amen. When he picked his team, he had your name on his mind. That's why you're in this building today. That's why you got up and fixed your hair, put your clothes on and drove your car to church because you know in your heart he loves you. If he did not love you, he would have not changed your life for you. If he would have not loved you, he would not have saved you from sickness, disease. Some of us in here should be dead today, but God loved us too much to let us die. I need you to tell four people, he loves me like that. Once you get a revelation of his love, life cannot afford to offer you anything that will sidetrack you or set you back. You need a revelation today that he loves you not some of the time. And he loves you to the end. I need you to tell him one more time. I'm telling you, he loves me like that. In verse 4, and I'm almost done. He said, in the midst of all this, my God today, he riseth from supper, laid aside his garment, took a towel, and girded himself. Poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, to wipe them with the towel that he was weary. I'm going to drop one more little in your window by love and I'll leave you alone. Love builds itself up through demonstration. Amen. Love builds itself up through demonstration. You can say you love somebody all day long. Words are weak. I said words are weak. Love is a verb. I'm going to say it again. Love is a verb. Well, if it's a verb, that means it's got to have an action attached to it. So he said, I'm not only going to tell you I love you, I'm going to show you how much I love you. So I'm going to rise up from this supper. And I love the way the Bible reads because it said he riseth from supper, insinuating the idea that in the middle of the meal he got up. Can I help you today? The Bible says he riseth from supper. Study it because it literally means he came out of vagueness or he stood up out of obscurity. In other words, he was just among them and one of them for a few minutes. But then he stood up. Can I tell you that sometimes God will come and sit among us to let you know he is with you. He'll just fellowship with you. 
You don't even know he's in the room. He's just hanging out. But there are other times that he sees a need in your life for him to rise up. In other words, come out of obscurity and manifest who he really is. I got a feeling this week that he may rise up from supper for somebody at the table and show himself for who he really is. I'm sorry, y'all. Y'all might not get this real good, but I got it real good this morning. I'm trying to impart it to you like I received it. He rose up out of obscurity. He stepped out of vagueness. He manifests his identity. He rose up from, he stood as a king in the midst of a people. He stood as a master in the midst of his servants. He stood as a father at the table of his sons. He stood as a counselor in the midst of confusion. I came by to tell you, get ready because God is about to rise up at your table. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Amen, amen. He rose up, and when he rose up, watch, watch the Bible, because the Bible says then he stooped down. Not only did he stoop down, he stripped himself, and then he began to serve. He stood up, he stooped down, he stripped himself, and then he began to serve them. My question is, why would you take time to kneel down and serve a people you were leading? I came by to tell you because he could afford to. Amen. Touch somebody and tell them there's a case for the comma. There's a case for the comma. Look at verse 3. Jesus knowing, this is what John said. Not Jesus, John said it. Jesus knowing, John 13, 3, that the Father had given all things into his hands. Watch it. And that he was come from God. Is that what it reads? Comma. And what? Went to God. Jesus knowing, God have mercy, that he came from God comma and went to God the comma affords him the opportunity to stand to stoop to strip and to serve let me tell you something when you know where you are from and you know where you are going you don't mind taking a little time to serve people because serving don't intimidate you. Serving does not change your direction. Oh, I wish I had a people that could hear this. I'm going to build a case for the comma. I'm going to build a case for the comma. See, serving does not bother people who know who they really are. Amen. Now you see in the king of kings, the Lord of lords, kneeling down, wiping dirt off a of man's feet. Whew. It seems as though that would position him in the place of a pauper. But while he was kneeling, washing their feet, he was never bigger than he was at that moment in their mind. Isn't it something powerful when you meet men and women of authority that have prestige, that have dignity, that have resource in certain relationships, yet they can take a moment of their time and just stop and serve you for just a minute. I don't know what that does to you, but that impresses me when a king can come down and act like a servant. It impresses me when a master can stop orchestrating everything and just settle down and serve a plate to somebody. That's impressive to me. Maybe not you. Maybe you need to keep them up there on that pedestal all the time but not me. I like it when they step down off the platform and say, how can I help you? You don't impress me by standing in front all the time. I don't know if I've got no people in here that's hearing this preach, I preach. But John put a comma in there. He put a comma. Jesus knew he came from God. And he knew he went to God. I need you to ask no less than three people, where are you from and, and where are you going? 
Where are you from? And where are you going? So I began my inquisitive journey of discovering why would you drop a comma in the sentence, John? Why would you need to tell us that Jesus knew he came from God and he went to God? Why is this necessary? Did you conjure this up in your own mind? Is this your own imagination running wild through the pen as it inks its way over the script? How did you come up with this dialogue? What made you say that? You didn't have to say that. You just threw that in, that Jesus knew he was from God and went to God. And then you told us about him washing men's feet. What is up with that? And when I began to think of why he would do this thing, I was led to John chapter 7, verse 25. The Bible says here, at that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they are trying to kill. Here he is publicly, and they not saying a word to him. This is still John writing, Elder Whitley. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Christ? Can I preach like I want to? Watch what they said, but we know where this man is from. When the Christ comes, no one will know where he's from. Then Jesus, still teaching, cried out, yes, you know me. Now this ain't John. Now this is Jesus. And you know where I am from. I am not here on my own. But he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him. And he sent me. See, you got me messed up with Nazareth and Bethlehem. You got me located in Nathaniel's region. You got me over there in the house of bread at Bethlehem. You think I'm from a region, but I'm from a man. You need to get a revelation that it doesn't matter where you was born. You could be born in Motel 6, but you wasn't sent from Motel 6. You was born from your mother's womb, but you were sent from a heavenly father. I came by to encourage you today. Don't let nobody run you down with your past and remind you of where you came from. Look at them and say, no, baby, that's where I was born, but that's not where I originated. You got to go further back. I didn't come from a place. I came from a man called Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi, Lord of Lords, God the Father, Yahweh. Are y'all in this building today? Touch somebody and tell them I was sent here. I'm I'm sorry, y'all. I'm too excited for you. He said, you you know me. He said, you know me. You know me. You know me. You already said you know me. I'm I'm Joseph's boy. I'm the carpenter's child. Now watch what verse 30 says. When he said, I know him because I am from him, and he sent me, don't miss verse 30. When he said this, they tried to seize him. But no one laid a hand on him. Because why? His time had not yet come. You can't do nothing to me unless God says you can. You can only destroy my name when God gives you the authority to do it. Y'all ain't hearing me. You can't even mess me up until God allows you to mess me up. I wish I had a church here today. I came by to tell you, it don't matter where you are in your life, Lord have mercy. You need to get a revelation that you are on assignment. Stop, Pastor Rick. So he says, now I'm going to go ahead and confirm to you that you know me. Now watch. But what I confirm that you know about me will not confine me to what you think about me. So if I confirm that, yeah, you do know me, Your thoughts and your opinions is not going to confine me to what you think about me. If I allowed you to do that, baby, you would be dictating my destiny. 
and you would be writing my story and nobody else. But today, I'm going to go ahead and reach over and pull an ink pen out your hand and put it back into the hand that orchestrated this thing from the beginning. I know you know me. Lord have mercy. Now watch verse 28 because he says, I know you know me, but in verse 28, Pastor D, he says, I know something you don't know. Huh. I'm not here on my own. Now watch what he says. But he who sent me is true. This is a beautiful thing because he says, he who sent me, he's saying this, he dispatched me to my destiny. I have been sent to stand and accomplish my assignment. I'm going to say it one more again. I have been sent to stand and accomplish my assignment. I'm going to say it one more time. I have been sent to stand and accomplish my assignment. I'm going to say it one more time. I have been sent to stand and accomplish my assignment. So therefore, I don't need your approval. I don't need your endorsement. And if I don't need your approval or your endorsement, then certainly your scrutiny is not going to sidetrack me. Are y'all in this building here now? I'm almost done. Hallelujah. He said, I am not here on my own, but he who sent me is true, truthful, not concealing. He has nothing to hide. Now I'm going to help you and I'm going to quit. He who sent me is true, not concealing. This is what you study to do the exegesis. He has nothing to hide. In other words, he didn't send you. Watch you mess up. Walk across here, Pastor Norris. Just walk slowly across the front. He didn't send you and then watch you and see you falter. Watch now. And then conceal you like he's ashamed of ever sending you. He that sent me is true. He is truthful. He does not, he has no reason to hide what he sent. Y'all not hearing me. He knew what you was going to do before you did it and he still sent you. Somebody need to clap their hands. You need to look at somebody and tell them he loves me to the end. He loves me like that. So he's not going to conceal me. He's not going to hide me just because you know me. I'm preaching a lot better than I'm hearing some shouting today. Tell somebody, shout, Pastor Rick, need to hear you shout. He that sent me is true. He's truthful. He does not conceal what he has said. He has nothing to hide. He still loves me. He still called me. He still anointed me. He still appointed me. He still deputized me. He still authorized me. And he ain't trying to hide like he made some kind of mistake. Woo! I need you to tell three people he's very proud of me. He still loves me. He even likes me. He even walks with me. He even talks with me. And he still has mantled me. And he still has anointed me. I ain't preaching about me. I'm preaching about you. Because listen, you are sent, not just born. He said, I know something you don't know. And I know someone you don't know. I know him who sent me. So if you got a problem with me, talk to him. Watch now. 
You can stand, sit, turn around, and jump. It don't make me no never mind. Now I'm home, baby. I'm there. Verse 30, when they heard the revelation, they tried to grab him. But no one laid a hand on him. My God, because his time had not yet come. Because you're not here on your own, you can't leave on your own. Thank you. I'm going to say it again. Because you're not here on your own, you can't leave on your own. Wouldn't it be a pleasant thought to just say, I'm done with this? No, you'll lose your mind. You'll go crazy because God not going to let you run from what he sent you to accomplish. I'm almost done now, see. They tried to get him. Touch somebody and tell them they tried to get me, baby. They tried to get me, but they couldn't lay a hand on him because his time had not come. Because if they could catch him, then that meant they had the authority to put him in and take him out. What I just told you is man did not call you in and man cannot take you out. Don't get twisted. Man didn't put you in this thing and man can't take you out of this thing. Listen, it's time for us to get some confidence in the comma. Jesus knew where he came from and he knew where he went. Stop wondering ambiguously with your assignment in life. Quit letting people talk you out of your purpose. Let's stand. God didn't even ask your permission when he called you. He didn't even have a dialogue with you and say, is it all right if I anoint you? He didn't ask you. He just did it because he loved you. And he loves you as much in the middle of your mess as he did before you ever stepped in it. I came by to tell you, you are important. You are significant. You are strategic. You have an agreement. You made a covenant with God before, etern before time ever began. You made it in eternity. Now quit acting like you don't want it when you already said yes. Quit acting like you're going to change your mind. When you know doggone good and well, God called you before you ever breathed one breath. And then I can see him letting you go with a smile on his face. Whoo, saying, go down there and do your thing. Just smiling, just patting you on the back when you was nothing but a spirit looking for a body to inhabit. And he's telling you, go, man. Go, girl. You go. That's how God loves you. And he said, I got so much confidence in you. Ooh, and he wouldn't even tell you about them scrapes you're going to have. Because he wasn't even worried about that. He wasn't even going to tell you about those betrayals. He was going to let you find out yourself. But he trusted you with rejection. He trusted you with betrayal. He trusted you with trouble. Because he knew you would not walk out on your assignment. And some of y'all have laid your call down. But today, you're going to pick your call back up. And you're going to do what God said for you to do.